cloning. Two topics today I want to look at. Cloning and stem cells. Two topics. Now, this is, I think, where it sort of gets interesting. Mm, you know, animals, a lot of animals have been cloned, right? Have humans been cloned? It's kind of a trick question. Right, Justin? Guess what? Humans have been cloned. Yeah. Humans have been cloned. But did you hear about this mistake in the news? This human cloning mistake where a kid turned out to be a sheep? What? No, I'm making that up. That's not real. That's fake news. <laughs> you ever heard that term, fake news? Oh my goodness. <sighs> Don't get me started. All right. Uh, <laughs> so, cloning and stem cells. These are a couple topics in genetics that are fraught with bioethical issues. Makes it interesting. You guys know who Jeff Goldblum is? An actor? Okay, I'm going to show you a little clip from Jurassic Park. Maybe you recognize it. And he's actually going to bring up some bioethics here. A bioethical issue. Uh, check this out. Okay, he's talking bioethics there, isn't he? Just because you can do something, should you do it? Or ought? A lot of times in bioethics we use the word ought rather than should. Um, interesting. You're going to see this in movies a lot. Bioethical issues. Now, there are two kinds of cloning that we're going to look at. Two ways of doing it. Cloning by twinning and cloning by something called nuclear transfer. You guys, that second one, that second one um, is the high-tech sci-fi sort of one, the second one. The first one, that's pretty easy. That happens all the time. Twinning, cloning by twinning, uh, raise your hand if you know any identical twin. Okay, they're clones. They are clones. Identical twins are clones. But they were formed by a process called twinning. Natural twinning, okay? Uh, are there identical twins in this building? Really? Are they in your class? I don't, I don't think I know any any here. Who, who are they? Who? Two boys on the soccer team and they're identical twins? Cool. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know them. Now, I mean, I have seen identical twins. But you know how identical twins form, right? You have a fertilized egg, and when it does its first mitosis division, splits in two, becomes two cells. That's a two-celled embryo. They're supposed to stay together. And then it does mitosis again and becomes a four-celled embryo. And then a mitosis again and becomes an eight-celled embryo. And then 16 cells, and then 32, and then 64, and so on, right? But way back when it's a two-celled embryo, sometimes, in, in about a, one out of 100 cases, sometimes those two cells, for some reason we don't understand completely, will break totally away from each other. 
And then this one becomes a two-celled embryo, this one becomes a two-celled embryo, and so on. But they're identical because they have identical chromosomes, right? Because remember what a cell does to its chromosomes before it does mitosis? Right, duplicates them. And so they've got identical chromosomes and they're identical, identical twins. So they're clones. Technically, they're clones. That's called cloning by twinning. And we're going to look at that first for a minute. Cloning by twinning. Recognize the picture? All right, now, some important vocabulary words we need to know about. The first one up here, letter A, quiescent. Anybody know what quiescent means? Quiescent? What's it sound like? Quiet? Quiescent. You know what a quiescent cell is or a quiescent nucleus? It's a nucleus that is shut down, turned off, inactive. All the genes are shut down. All the genes are turned off. Let me show you what happens to the nucleus of a cell, you guys, when it goes quiescent. Watch the hand. Here, here's the nucleus of a cell. When it goes quiescent, this is what it does. It shrinks down in size, shuts down, turns off. All the genes in it totally turned off. Okay, look at these two different kinds of cells up here. Okay, here's the egg cell. Here's the nucleus of the egg, female pronucleus, right? Remember that? There's the sperm. There's a, look at the nucleus of that sperm. Which of these two nuclei? egg or sperm looks quiescent. Claudia? The nucleus. The nucleus. nucleus of what? Sperm or egg? Oh, the egg. Now remember, a quiescent nucleus is shrunken down. It's really small. That is quiescent. Okay. So in other words, all the genes in the head of that sperm, that, that's the nucleus right there. A sperm is pretty much just a nucleus with a tail, okay? But see how small it is? It's shut down, it's quiescent. All the genes inside the head of that sperm are shut down and turned off, okay? That nucleus, that quiescent nucleus, is a little bit like a computer that's not only shut down but unplugged. Okay. You ever have a problem with your computer and to fix it you just sort of shut the thing down and unplug it for a while? You, ever, you notice how that sometimes will fix problems? It resets everything. Bless you. Um, the nucleus of a cell that is quiescent is like a computer full of information. Like a computer that's been shut down and unplugged. Nothing happened. Now, if you look at the nucleus of the egg, it's not quiescent, but it's undifferentiated. In other words, this egg is not specialized. Okay? It's not a muscle cell. It's not a skin cell. It's not a bone cell. It's not a pancreas cell. It's an undifferentiated egg cell. And it's undifferentiated because the genes in that nucleus that specify be a, be a skin cell, or be a muscle cell, or be a nerve cell, all those genes are turned off. So the nucleus of that egg, it's not quiescent, but it's undifferentiated, okay? All the genes that, like I said, that say be a, be a skin cell, or be a muscle cell, or be a bone cell, all those genes are off. So that nucleus is a little bit like a computer that's plugged in and turned on, but no applications are open. Okay, guys, give me some examples. What are some applications that you use? 
on your computer? What are some applications that you use? Just start shouting them out. What? Facebook. Oh, Facebook! Oh, me too sometimes. Mostly I'm on Facebook just so I can see pictures of grandkids. Okay. Facebook, what else? Word. 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 <laughs> Use Word all the time. Okay. What else? Web browsers, right? Like any Mac, any Mac users in here? Safari, yeah. Uh, Photoshop, anybody use Photoshop? There's a lot of applications, right? There's some games. Uh, the nucleus of that egg is like a computer. It's plugged in, turned on, no applications are open. Let's think of the applications are sort of like genes, okay? So in that nucleus, if a gene were turned on, that would be like an application that's opened up. Make sense? Okay. The quiescent, that sperm nucleus quiescent. It's like a computer that's shut down and unplugged. All right, now let's see. You remember what happens? What's it look like has happened now in this picture a few hours later? What's happened? What's happened to the uh, nucleus of the sperm? Should I use the random pointing finger of doom? What is? The nucleus is released, yeah, the head of the sperm cell is disintegrated, the nucleus is released. Does that nucleus look like it's still quiescent? No! You know what? It's not quiescent anymore. It's a computer that's been plugged in and turned on. No applications are open yet, okay? There's actually some proteins in the cytoplasm of the egg that turn that sperm nucleus on. That basically take that sperm nucleus and plug it in and turn it on. So now it's ready to go. Now let's see what happens later. Ah, male and female pronuclei fuse together. Chromosomes coil up and get short, fat, thick. Remember this? Nod your head yes if you remember this. The cells start to go into mitosis. Oh, raise your hand when you know the answer. What stage of mitosis is that? Raise your hand when you know the answer. Everybody knows this, I think. Raise your hand when you've got the answer in your head. Is it prophase, metaphase, anaphase, or telophase? Justin, what is it? Metaphase. Excellent, it is metaphase. Metaphase. And then the cell divides in two, becomes a two-celled embryo. Looks like uh, two eggs sunny side up, doesn't it? Anybody have eggs this morning for breakfast? No? Okay. Two-celled embryo. It's going to do mitosis again. It's going to become a four-celled embryo. Oh, quick check. I wonder if anybody knows this. What's this membrane around here called? Raise your hand if you think you know the answer. What's this membrane around the uh, two-celled embryo called? Zona. Excellent! You are in the zona today, right? That's terrible, I know. The zona, zona pellucida. Remember, that's the, uh, that's the membrane that, that hardens like a shell. When the first sperm gets in, that triggers it to harden like a shell. That prevents other sperm from getting in. Oh, I was thinking about that the other night. I try not to do it too often. It's something I do some nights. I try not to do it too often. I'll scoop up some ice cream in a bowl. And... Uh, you ever put magic shell on ice cream? You guys know what that is? Raise your hand if you know what that is. 
<laughs> okay. You know, it's like chocolate syrup, only when you put it on, it gets cold, it hardens, becomes shell-like. Anyway, I did that the other night, and I thought, that's just like the zona hardening when the first sperm gets into the egg. So it reminded me of it. And you crack it with your spoon. You had to be there. I mean, I thought about that when I was... I said to my wife, wife, this is just like the zona pellucida. She said, what are you talking about? You had to be there. Okay. All right, so there's a two-celled embryo. Now, sometimes, remember I said about one out of 100 times, those two cells will break totally away from each other, and then you get identical twins. Like these two red hat ladies. Okay. <laughs> identical twins. Look at them. Hard to tell them apart, isn't it? Hmm. Identical twins. All right. Did you guys know, check the date on this, did you guys know that back in November of 1993, this was reported? The first laboratory duplication of a human embryo raises the question, where do we draw the line? Back in 1993, it was reported. First reported case of the creation of human clones in the laboratory. I'll bet you didn't know that, did you? Artificially created in a lab, human clones. For real. You know what they did? You know how they did it? Okay, here's what some researchers did. They took fertilized eggs from in vitro fertilization. Uh, the couple donated a few of these fertilized eggs. Now these fertilized eggs happened to be abnormal. They weren't going to make babies. Okay? They were in the laboratory um, from an in vitro fertilization clinic. They weren't going to make babies. They were abnormal fertilized eggs. In other words, they had too many chromosomes, multiple chromosomes. And so all the researchers knew that these fertilized eggs were going to die within a day or two anyway. They, there's no way they could make it. Okay? They had like, instead of 46 chromosomes, 69. It was one of those, you know, those, sometimes it happens. You'll get two sperms that will get into the egg at the exact same time. And so you get a fertilized egg with three sets of chromosomes. And so these were abnormal fertilized eggs. So they're going to die anyway. So what the researchers did was, under the microscope, they watched these fertilized eggs, just a few of them, they watched them do their first mitosis division and become two-celled embryos like that. Okay? Remember, they're going to die within a day, probably. And so what they did then, under the microscope, with very fine microscopic instruments, they teased apart these two cells, separated them in the Petri dish. So then they had two individual cells from this. And that's it. So technically, they separated them under the microscope. And that's called cloning. But when it hit the news, you saw the news article? When it hit the news, people went nuts. What? These scientists were cloning humans in the laboratory? Well, technically, that's what they were, right? And then, then after they separated themselves, the cells died in the petri dish. But they successfully, under the microscope, split those two-celled embryos. So is that, what do you think? Is that cloning? I mean, they didn't create, you know, full 
clone, identical clone human beings, but that's what they did. Technically, they cloned that, that embryo. And so people got all excited and said, what in the world are those scientists doing? Maybe this could happen someday if things get out of hand, right? You know that's a fake picture, right? A family of little boys that have been cloned. Now, what do you notice about all those boys? Do you notice any differences in, in those any of those boys? They all have different personalities. Well, that's, oh, looks like they all have different personalities. Sorry, I gave one away. Do you notice any other differences? The shirts. The shirts. Of the identical twin pairs that you know. Okay, you're talking about the soccer players. I, I don't know them. I'm sorry. I wish I knew them. Do you know them very well? I mean, do they have different personalities? Kind of. Kind of? Yeah, that's because they're individual persons. You see, if humans are ever cloned, where they grow up and they become adults and whatnot, they're going to have different personalities because they're individuals. Just like identical twins are individuals. They're not exactly the same person. All right. Now, anybody in here have an identical twin? Probably not. Are you guys like me? You were a boring singleton bird? Well, not boring. I shouldn't say that. You guys are not boring. I'm boring, right? Yes. <laughs> I was a singleton bird. I do not have an identical twin. So this is the path I followed. When I was a two-celled embryo, those two cells stayed stuck together. I became a two-celled embryo. Then four, and then eight, and so on. Check it out. Eight cells right there. Now, you know what you could do, theoretically? It's been done with, like, rabbits and mice and cows. Here's what you could do. Let's, let's say this is, uh, theoretically, we could do this. I'm not saying we should do this. This is an eight cell human embryo in a Petri dish under the microscope. Theoretically, you could take and tease apart these eight individual cells. Now check this out. Ladies, raise your hand if you would volunteer for this. Wait, you don't know what I'm gonna say, right? We could take, we got how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, wait. One, two. Okay. We could take, tease these eight cells apart and put this one in the uterus of surrogate mother number one. Put the second cell in the uterus of surrogate mother number two. Now you wouldn't volunteer for this, right? We could put these eight individual cells into the uteri uteruses of eight different surrogate mothers and then nine months later they would give birth to identical octuplets born to these eight different women. I mean each woman gives birth to one baby but those eight babies would be identical. You don't call them twins, you call them octuplets. That's called cloning by twinning. Make sense? So this, each of these eight cells in this embryo has the total ability to become a new person. Lily, I think you had your hand going up. Is that the cloning by embryo twinning? Yeah, that would be cloning by twinning. Okay? Cloning by twinning. Now the reason each of those eight individual cells in that eight-celled embryo, the reason they can do that is because at that stage each of those cells is, here's the second word, totipotent. Those cells are totipotent. That's a fun word to say, especially with a British accent maybe. Totipotent. 
totipotent. That's the ability of a cell to develop into an entire new person. Totipotent. You could also say those cells are undifferentiated. They haven't specialized yet. So this cell in this eight-celled embryo, for example, put it in the uterus of a surrogate mother, a volunteer. It grows into a baby because that cell is totipotent. All right. Now, if we took, let's say, all right, let's say one of my skin cells. Pick one of my skin cells right here. Highly specialized. Uh, the nucleus of this skin cell is like a computer that's plugged in, turned on, and the only applications in that computer that are open, or the genes that are on, are the ones that specify how to be a skin cell. All the other applications, all the other genes, like the ones that specify how to be a liver cell, or how to be a bone cell, those are all turned off. They're, I mean, they're not even open, those applications. So could you take this skin cell, I know this sounds gross, why would you do it? If you took this skin cell and put it into the uterus of a surrogate mother, would it grow into a clone of me over a nine month period? Why not? It's differentiated, it's highly differentiated. It's not totipotent, okay? It's highly specialized, it's a differentiated. Hey, look at this. All right, now that's an actual photograph. Big one. That's an actual photograph of a human embryo, eight-celled human embryo taken through an electron microscope. Um, does anybody know what this is? It, it's resting on this. Whatever this is. Anybody know what this is? You know what that is? Okay. Good guess. No, that's a good guess. This is the, the very tip, the very pointy tip of a sewing needle. That's what this is. Okay? Raise your hand if you've ever, like, sewed a button on. Or, all right. Raise your hand if you've ever touched the end of a sewing needle with your finger. You know what I'm talking about? Pretty sharp. This is the tip of a sewing needle, magnified quite a few times. And it's a sharp, pointy sewing needle, but under the microscope, it doesn't look quite so sharp. See how big this eight-celled human embryo is? I mean, you, you need a microscope, really. Unless you're under age 35, then you might be able to see it with the naked eye. Maybe. Tiny, tiny, tiny pencil dot is barely visible on your paper. Okay, so it's pretty small. All right, this is, okay, 16 cells. Going through mitosis again. You think these cells are totipotent? These 16 cells? You could tease them apart in the Petri dish, put those 16 cells into 16 different volunteer surrogate mother women. Nine months later, they give birth to 16 identical clones. That would be embryo, that would be cloning by 20, okay? There's something wrong with this photograph, though. This is an old picture, an artist's picture of a 16-celled embryo. Does anybody see anything that looks like it's not quite right? What's the zona doing there? Claudia? It looks like it's kind of melting or breaking up. Yeah, the, the artist who painted that, that was before we discovered that uh, 
four days after fertilization, the hardened zona breaks open, it cracks open like this, and then the embryo comes out. Okay, that was before they discovered hatching. So they're showing it, they're, they're, they're just showing the zona sort of melting away. It doesn't work like that. By this stage, the zone is hard like a shell, it cracks open, the embryo comes out. Okay, but we'll forgive the artist. I mean, whoever it was, that person didn't know. Right? All right. Remember all this stuff? Yeah, hatching has to happen about day four, well, a little bit after day four, so the embryo can come out and attach to the lining of the uterus. Now, let's see, what's coming up next? Well, that's that same picture. Okay, now, hmm, this is about six days after fertilization. You think those individual cells are still totipotent? No, they're not, not, not anymore. Claudia, you were shaking your head no. Why do you think they're not totipotent? Just taking a guess? Because there's so many of them that are already starting to create a child. They've started specializing. Yep. They've started specializing. We've got two kinds of cells that make up this embryo now. They've started to specialize. If we slice this embryo in half, look what we're going to see. Okay, see? This little embryo now is made up of two different kinds of cells. An outer layer here called trophoblast. It's going to send out those finger-like chorionic villi that invade the lining of the uterus so the blastocyst embryo can attach. It's made up of those kind of cells. It's made up of a different kind of cell mass in the middle here. See this group of cells in the middle? That's what's going to become the baby. This out here, that's eventually going to develop into the Placenta. Remember the placenta? Um, just in case. Do I have a placenta here? I do. Just in case. We forget. We don't want to forget the placenta. Remember the placenta? Okay, check it out. You've seen this, right? Okay, here's the fetus, and there's a placenta right here. So that placenta forms from that outer layer of cells. The actual baby comes from this inner cell mass right here. It's about 40 cells right there. This whole thing, okay, if you take a pencil, and lightly touch your paper, make a dot that even I could see with the naked eye. I mean, still really, really tiny. That's how big this blastocyst embryo is. Okay, so those cells are not totipotent anymore. Not anymore. You guys didn't stay looking like that, neither did I. Eventually, you look like this. Remember, Angela, remember when your heart was on the outside? Your heart was out here. Here's your heart. Actually, right back here, you had a, really a two-chambered heart then, like a fish, kind of. Fortunately, it became four chambers, eventually. Okay. Maria, there's you. About eight weeks after fertilization. Okay? Two months. That's you. Ten weeks. See the umbilical cord? There's that placenta knitted into the lining of mama's uterus. That's the way most of us went. Singleton births. Now let's look at the uh, other method, the little bit more high-tech method of cloning. This is the one most people think of when they think of human cloning. 
cloning by nuclear transfer. We're talking about transferring a nucleus from one cell into another. You guys with me on this? Hang in there. We're transferring a nucleus from one cell to another. Time out. We're going to wait till everybody comes back to life. Do I have to sing a country song? Whoa! Do I need to sing a country song? Good grief! You don't want to hear me sing. Trust me. You don't want to hear me sing a country song. Unless I will take requests. Okay. Cloning by nuclear transfer. We need to see how this works. All right. First mammal formed using cloning by nuclear transfer. Now this was long before you guys were born, so I know you don't remember this, but her name was Dolly, and she was a sheep. You ever heard of her? How in the world have you heard of her? It was before you were born. Didn't she pass away in 2003? Not too long ago. She got some kind of strange, well, some kind of uh, type of pneumonia that sheep sometimes get. Very sad. The whole world mourned. Well, not really. Those who knew Dolly mourned. Okay, there's the Time Magazine article that announced it for the general public. March 10th, 1997. Will there be another U? I think they should have written E-W-E -E there, okay? Will there ever be another U? But they wrote Y-O-U. So, yeah, she made headlines. Now, this is the guy who created her. Dr. Ian Wilmot, a biologist in Scotland. Actually, he and his lab, scientists don't normally work by themselves. They work in teams, okay? So he had all these graduate students and postdocs working with him. They worked together. They created this first cloned mammal. Now, how'd they do it? Okay, here's how they did it. Now, this is the... Uh, step-by-step -step version for left-brainers. And this is the diagrammatic version for right-brainers, okay? Both these explain it. This is the recipe. So, Sydney, if you want to clone a, an animal, a mammal, this is how you do it. Okay, this is one way to do it. And what they did was they took, okay, they took this sheep right here, and uh, they took a cell from the mammary gland, from the udder. You know what udder is, right? An udder. An udder. Mammary gland. They took a cell from the mammary gland. And that's a body cell. Here it is. They call her the donor. Uh, she's not Dolly, okay? She's the donor. All right, so here's the mammary gland cell. And what kind of a recipe is in the nucleus of that cell? A recipe for what? For what? Okay, mammary gland cells, and guess what? All the other cells in the body. The entire recipe for that entire sheet. The entire recipe is in that nucleus. But you're right. The only genes in that nucleus that are on, the only applications that are open, are the ones that specify how to be a mammary gland cell. All the other genes are turned off. But all the genes are there. Okay? All the genes that spell out the entire recipe for how to make this sheep are in that nucleus. If this was a human, there would be 46 chromosomes in that nucleus of that cell. But this is not a human, it's a sheep. But it's a mammal. Okay? Then they took another sheep. This sheep doesn't look like she really agreed with the procedure, but she had no choice. They took an egg cell from another, a different breed of sheep here. This is the egg. And they sucked the nucleus out of that egg. 
You know what you have if you have an egg and you suck the nucleus out? You know what you have then? An egg with no nucleus. It's called an enucleated egg. Yeah. Enucleate the egg cell. It's an enucleated egg. They suck the nucleus out with a little pipette. Suck the nucleus out. So here's the enucleated egg. See that? Now, in the petri dish, under the microscope, they joined together the donor cell from that donor sheep with the enucleated egg, hit it with a little jolt of electricity, and that caused the nucleus of the mammary gland cell to go into the egg. So now here you've got an egg with a new nucleus inside of it. A new nucleus. Where did this nucleus come from? Where did it come from? The mammary gland cell, right? From that sheep up there. See, we're going to make an exact copy of this sheep right here, following the recipe in the nucleus of the cell from that sheep. So now you've got an enucleated egg that has a new nucleus in it. It's diploid, a diploid nucleus. What recipe is in that nucleus, Sydney? What nucleus, or excuse me, what recipe is in this nucleus? Recipe for what? For the first sheep. For the first sheep. Okay. And then they put this into a petri dish of nutrient solution so it could grow. So it could become an embryo like this. But guess what? It died. It didn't work. And they tried over 200 times. And it only got this far and it died. It never went this far. It never became an embryo. It died. Over 200 tries, over 200 tries. So they tried doing all different kinds of things. Finally, somebody hit upon the idea, okay, trial and error. After 200 plus tries, finally somebody said, let's try something different. So here's what they did. When they got to this stage right here, the egg has a new nucleus in it from the donor. In the petri dish, they started depriving it of nutrients. They started to starve that cell with its new nucleus. They starved it. No, no, they didn't starve it to death. They just took away food so that it almost starved to death, but not quite. And when they did that, here's what they noticed the nucleus doing. Watch this. What the nucleus did. It shut down, turned off, it became like a computer that was shut down and unplugged. Like the quiescent nucleus of a sperm. Okay? And then there were certain proteins in the cytoplasm of the egg, certain proteins in the cytoplasm of the egg, then kicked into gear plugged that nucleus back in, turned it on, okay, uh, none of the applications are open, it sort of like rebooted it, and then the thing split in two, it became a two-celled embryo, and then four, and then eight, and so on, an embryo like this, and then they put this embryo into the uterus of a surrogate mother, she and then she gave birth to this little lamb that they named Dolly. This is Dolly. Okay, that's the clone. And Dolly was exactly identical to this sheep up here. So that's how they did it. That's how they did it. Make sense? So if we wanted to clone Daquan, Actually, if the newspapers got a hold of this, they'd probably go crazy, right? What? They're going to clone Daquan? 
at Jeff High School. Why do I do that? I think it would be cool, don't you, to have a couple big quads running around, maybe half a dozen. Think how that would work. Daquan, you could send your clone to genetics class and you just stay home and sleep in, right? Mr. Roll would take attendance and he wouldn't know any different, unless he really got to know you. Um, okay, let's say we want to clone Daquan. Here's what you do. All right, let's replace these with human examples here. Uh, you take some woman who donates a body cell. Let's personalize this. Who wants to donate the body cell? Make believe here. Actually, it wouldn't have to be a female. Justin? And Justin donates a skin cell. We take a skin cell from Justin. Okay, here it is. That nucleus contains a recipe for you. And we, we take the nucleus from your skin cell. Wait, who donated the egg? Who, oh, oh, we need a woman to donate an egg. Wait a minute. No. We don't want to clone you. We want to clone Daquan, right? Right? <coughs> Sorry, Justin. We'll clone you next time. We take a skin cell from Daquan. Here you go. Daquan, what's in that nucleus? A recipe for you, right? We're going to take that nucleus, we're going to put it into an egg that's had its nucleus removed. Okay, ladies, who's going to donate the egg? I need a volunteer. Angie, good. We take an egg cell from you. Okay, here it is. We suck the nucleus out, now it's an enucleated egg. And we take the nucleus from Daquan's skin cell, we put it in the egg. And here it is. Now, we starve it in a petri dish to make that nucleus go quiescent, so we can reboot it, right? Reboot that thing. And then in the petri dish, we let it grow up to become like an O16 cell, 32 cell embryo. And then we're going to put that into the uterus of a surrogate mother. Okay, vol any volunteers? Surrogate mother? Laura, okay. And then nine months later, you give birth to Daquan's identical twin. That's how it would work. Uh, I'm not saying we should do that. It's hypothetical, right? This is how it would work. Now, Daquan, your clone, your identical twin, would look just like you. Just, just like you. Just like you did. To how old are you? 17 years ago. It would look just like you 17 years ago. So it would be your identical twin, only you'd be 17 years apart. That, that twin, that clone of yours, would be a you know, totally different person because it would grow up in a different time period and be exposed to different music, different TV shows, different movies, different friends, different teachers. I might still be around. Maybe. Different environment, right? It'd be a different person. So that's how it would work. So they named this little lamb that was born, this clone, they named her, uh, they named her Dolly. But they named her Dolly, they named her after um, Dolly Parton. Because the, the donor cell came from the mammary gland of, of the, the adult sheep up there. Now, <laughs> I read an article shortly afterwards where uh, some reporters interviewed Dolly Parton and asked her how she felt about that. But how did you feel about the fact that they named that baby lamb after you? And she actually had a really good attitude, a healthy, 
healthy, good sense of humor. She laughed and said that she was honored. <laughs> she felt honored. They thought she was going to be mad. You know, the reporter thought she'd be upset. She said she was honored to have this baby lamb named after her. So that's how Dolly got its name. New topic. Take a look. Page 16. New topic. Top of page 16. Embryonic stem cells. I'll bet you, you guys have heard of these, have you? Embryonic stem cells? Where do they come from? Embryos. You have to destroy a human embryo to get them. Do you think they're controversial? Fraught with bioethical issues, for sure. Here's a uh, National Geographic article that came out several years ago about embryo, embryonic stem cells, how far will we go? Much controversy. Let me show you where you get embryonic stem cells. Uh, anybody in here in med terms or health science, have you learned about embryonic stem cells? Is anybody in anatomy and physiology? Have you learned about embryonic stem cells? Now, I know you guys all have biology. Did you learn it a little bit about embryonic stem cells? Maybe not. Okay, let me show you. Raise your hand if you've heard of embryonic stem cells. Okay, let me show you where they are. Okay, look familiar? Okay, we've got fertilization. Now we've got a two-celled embryo. And we become 4, 8, 16, 32, morula, blastocyst. Here we are about six days after fertilization. Blastocyst. Take your pencil, touch your paper, make a dot that you can hardly see, but maybe Mr. Rule could see it with the naked eye. That's how big this embryo is. Okay, let's look inside of it, cut it in half. Inner cell mass, made up of about 40 cells. That's what's going to become the baby. Okay, if you scrape those cells out, those 40 cells out, put them in a Petri dish with nutrient solution, then they're called embryonic stem cells. So this is where those embryonic stem cells you've heard about, that's where they come from. This inner mass of about 40 cells in the blastocyst that would become the baby. But under the microscope, if you scrape those 40 cells out, like I said, put them in a Petri dish with nutrient solution, get them to grow, then they're called embryonic stem cells. Now, of course, to get those embryonic stem cells, you've got to do what with this embryo, this human embryo? It, that destroys the embryo, that kills it. Do you see why it's a bioethical issue? Okay, now it's kind of interesting. Um, if you do consider the size of it, anybody know what this is? A photograph taken with an electron microscope. That's the eye of a needle. That's the eye of a sewing needle. You ever try to thread a sewing needle? Crazy! Ah! You have to take that end of that thread and sometimes it helps if you moisten it, right? In case the end of it's frayed a little bit. Then you got thread that eye of that needle, put that. Raise your hand if you've ever tried to do that. Okay, you know when I do that now, I have to put my glasses on. Okay, I just do. <sighs> it happens, but it's not easy. That's a pretty small. Let me show you how big the blastocyst is compared to that. The human blastocyst. Uh, there it is. See? 
So now you get an idea of the size of this little embryo. Now, it's interesting, some people, if you put that blastocyst embryo under a microscope, some people, when they look through that microscope, you know what they're going to say? If you're talking about embryonic stem cells, here's what they're going to say. They're going to say, I see nothing more. Yes, it's an early six-day embryo, but it's just a clump of cells. And it would be immoral not to take those embryonic stem cells and grow them in the laboratory and use those use those cells to cure somebody's disease, maybe help repair somebody's spinal cord so that they could get up out of their wheelchair and walk. It would be immoral not to do that. Okay? Or it would be immoral not to take those embryonic stem cells and grow them in the laboratory to try to make new pancreas cells to put into somebody who has diabetes and cure their diabetes. Or get those embryonic stem cells in the Petri dish to grow into new retina cells that could be transplanted into somebody's retina and cure their blindness. It would be immoral not to do that. On the other hand, you're going to get some people who look through the microscope and they're going to say, that's an early human embryo it would be immoral to scrape out those embryonic stem cells and use them for, in medicine. It would be immoral because you're destroying that human embryo. Do you see how complicated it is? See why it was a hot issue when this was first worked out? Embryonic stem cells, controversial for sure. There they are. I remember when this happened, August 20th, 2001. This is the guy at the University of Wisconsin who first did this, who first got embryonic stem cells to grow in the laboratory. Not an easy thing to do. Okay, his name is James Thompson, University of Wisconsin. He published it in this journal, Science, November 6, 1998. That's the leading scientific journal in the United States. That's where it was published. Here's the title. Embryonic stem cell lines derived from human blastocysts. They used in the laboratory human blastocyst embryos left over from an in vitro fertilization clinic. That's where they did this work. Very difficult to take human blastocyst embryos in the lab, take out the embryonic stem cells, put them in petri dishes of nutrient solution, and get them to grow and do mitosis and make more and more embryonic stem cells. That's really hard to do. And he pulled it off. And this was a huge advancement. A lot of people in medical research got real excited about this. Because you can take embryonic stem cells in petri dishes in the lab and by adding certain proteins to the different dishes you could get a dish of embryonic stem cells to become pancreas cells you could get another dish to become bone cells you could get another dish to become skin cells or muscle cells or retina cells for the eye you can get them to develop into any of the 220 different kinds of cells that make up the body and use them in medicine and people got real excited about this. Now, the news didn't hit the general public big time too much because do you know anything else that happened in 2001? What else happened in 2001? What? 9-11. Just, okay, there, the date on that Time Magazine is August 20th, September 11th. It wasn't too long after that that 9-11 happened, September 11th, and that took everybody's attention off of this. So people kind of forgot about this. 
rightly so, focused on 9-11. So it was big news in the medical community, but the general public kind of really didn't know about it that much or pay that much attention to it. You guys, look, here's how it works. Okay, here's how it works. You got a fertilized egg, becomes a four-celled embryo, eight cells, 16, 32, Moriola, blastocyst. Here it is about six days later. Here's that inner cell mass, okay? So watch this. You could do this at home. No, not really. You scrape out those embryonic stem cells and you put them in petri dishes with nutrient solution. So if you add certain protein molecules, certain signals, you could get them to develop into muscle cells, or you could get them to develop into pancreas cells, or you could get them to develop into nerve cells, or potentially, like I said, any of the 220 different kinds of cells that make up the body. That's how it works. That's how it works. Now here's some of the possible cells you could make in the lab. White blood cells, red cells, gland cells, nerve cells, skin cells, muscle cells, bone cells, connective tissue, and any kinds of cells. Depending on what pathway those undifferentiated cells specialize to become differentiated. Now, like, look at this nerve cell. Maybe that's a brain cell. In that nucleus, what genes are turned on in that nucleus? What applications are open in that nucleus? The ones that specify how to be what kind of cell? A brain cell, right? All the other genes are there. They're just turned off. Okay. So embryonic stem cells, see this is why medical researchers got so excited. You could get them in the lab to become, for example, eye cells, rods and cones in the retina. Use those cells maybe to cure somebody of their blindness. Or maybe get them to develop into bone marrow cells. Use them to cure somebody of their leukemia. Or maybe get them to develop into brain cells. Transplant them into the brain, cure somebody's Alzheimer's or Parkinson's maybe in the future. Or get them to develop into muscle cells. We have a student here at Jeff. He, he and a football player made the front page of the Journal and Courier last week. Name's Cody. He's got muscular dystrophy. Can you imagine taking somebody like that, creating new muscle cells from embryonic stem cells, transplanting them somehow into the patient, and that child with muscular dystrophy gets up out of his wheelchair and walks? Can you imagine? You see why medical researchers got so excited when Thompson and his crew at University of Wisconsin figured this stuff out? <clears throat> All right, embryonic stem cells. But boy, then, I'll uh, tell you what, <laughs> it really got controversial. Okay, this is Newsweek way back then. Stem cell wars, in other words, people fighting over whether it's right or wrong. It says there's hope for Alzheimer's, heart disease, Parkinson's, and diabetes, but will Bush cut off the money? Okay, back then it was President George W. Bush. Yeah, you could do this with other species. Like mice, laboratory mice. But see, the dream was to do it with humans, okay? Um, you, got, you guys are, you were pretty young back then. How old were you, you guys in 2001? A month old. A month old. Baby. You were babies. 
Have you read about in history President George W. Bush? He was president before Barack Obama. Barack Obama came after Bush. Okay. Did Bush cut the money off? Graham Brownick stem cell research, do you guys know? Do you know if he did or? Raise your hand if you know what he did. This came out, politicians started looking at this. Okay, let me ask you a question that maybe you probably know the answer. Okay, President George W. Bush, in the early 2000s, uh, Republican or Democrat? Republican. Conservative or liberal? Conservative. Do you think he cut the money off or not? Yes. Okay, when this came out, everybody said, wait a minute, is this the right thing to do? Sacrificing human embryos, you know? So, uh, yeah, <laughs> the money was cut off for the research. And now, not totally, well, yeah. 90% <laughs> of the research labs in the country get some money from the federal government, the U.S. government, okay, grant money comes from tax dollars. 90% of the research labs. 10% of the research labs are privately funded. And they're just funded by generous donors, okay? The way the rules were worked out back in that day, 2001, uh, Bush did cut the money off. The, the way the rules changed, they went something like this. If you're a, an embryologist, one who does research with human embryos, you may use, you may continue to make new lines, in other words, batches of petri dishes with embryonic stem cells. You may continue to sacrifice human embryos to produce embryonic stem cells if your lab receives no federal funding. Excuse the interruption. The students that are enrolled in the Go Ivy Day visit should now report to the front lobby at this time. That the students that are going to the Go Ivy Day today need to report to the front lobby at this time. Thank you. So in other words, you could continue doing embryonic stem cell research if your lab receives no federal funding. And 90% of the labs in the country receive federal funding. But if you work in a private lab, you could continue to do embryonic stem cell research. Okay? So the funds were you know, practically cut off. That makes sense? If you worked in a federally funded lab, you could continue to do research on existing stem cell lines. In other words, batches of petri dishes that already had embryonic stem cells growing in them. You could do that. You just can't destroy any future human embryos to make new lines of embryonic stem cells. So could they like find a loophole where the private ones make the stem cells and then send them to the mm. No, well, that makes sense, doesn't it? But no, they couldn't do that. That's a good question. Good question. So in other words, it, it, really, uh, it really shut down a lot of the embryonic stem cell research in the U.S. Now, some other countries continued doing it, like China continued doing embryonic stem cell research. So, okay, that's the story. Now, who came in and became president after George W. Bush? Who? Barack Obama. Democrat or Republican? Democrat. Liberal or conservative? Compared to Bush. More to the left, more liberal. He relaxed those rules under his administration. But while scientists were trying to do research during the Bush administration, since they couldn't really do much research on embryonic stem cells, they had to try to find 
stem cells in other places, and so they resorted to doing research on adult stem cells, which is not controversial, you're going to find out. And so research on adult stem cells actually grew and expanded under the Bush administration. But President Obama did come in and relax the rules on <coughs> embryonic stem cells. Okay. That's a little bit of the history of that. Let's look at some characteristics of embryonic stem cells. And you guys can write these down, okay? Characteristics. These cells in the petri dishes in the lab, they are undifferentiated. Embryonic stem cells, undifferentiated. Wait, what's that mean? They haven't specialized yet. They haven't specialized yet. They haven't become bone or muscle or skin or heart. But if you give them certain proteins, you feed them certain proteins in those petri dishes, they will then specialize. They'll, they'll differentiate into whatever kind of cells you want to make them. Here's something else that's true about embryonic stem cells in a petri dish. They have telomerase activity. The telomerase genes in those cells are on. What's that do? It, yeah, telomerase, remember that's the enzyme that makes the telomeres on the ends of the chromosomes long, forever long. So embryonic stem cells in petri dishes in the lab, as they're growing, they never age. They just keep dividing and dividing and dividing. Keep on going. They just keep dividing. They don't age. They don't quit dividing. And so when the petri dish gets a little crowded, they have to transfer some of them into new fresh petri dishes, keep them going, which is kind of a good thing. So you can get a good supply of those cells going. Oh, here's another ah, important new vocabulary word. They're pluripotent. Embryonic stem cells are what we call pluripotent. Now they're not totipotent. Wait, what's totipotent mean? Oh, that was a word way back at the beginning of class. What was it? What's totipotent? Okay, a cell that has the ability to turn into a complete person is totipotent. Okay, embryonic stem cells. They're not totipotent, they're something else. Pluripotent. That means they can develop into any kind of body cell. They can't develop into a whole person, but they can develop into any kind of body cell. So they're pluripotent. Those are characteristics. All right. All right, so like I said, lots of bioethical issues related to embryonic stem cells. Some of the people that argue for using embryonic stem cells have said, as of this writing here, <laughs> hey, there are 430, almost now 500 in vitro fertilization labs in the US, 400,000 frozen embryos in storage. That's a lot. 15,000 of them throughout the country are unclaimed. Why not just use those? That's what people are saying who are in favor of embryonic stem cell research. Why not just use those? Here's another, that's kind of a editorial cartoon. Looks like a politician probably. It's time those of us opposed to embryonic stem cell research stood up to be counted. Here's a little guy in a wheelchair. It's easy for you to say, mister. Makes you think, right? Makes you think. All right. What's on the next page? Page 16. Oh. Yeah, after five years, any of those unclaimed embryos in those in vitro clinics have to be destroyed if they're unclaimed. 
what? They can't keep storing them forever. And so some people say, shouldn't they be used? Just see all the bioethical issues going on here. Do you guys know who that is? Michael J. Fox? He's an actor. Raise your hand if you're familiar with him. Let me show you an old movie that he was in a long time ago. What disease does he have? You guys know? Parkinson's disease. So he's one of these people who could benefit from embryonic stem cell research. So here he is testifying before Congress arguing about relaxing, this was way back in the early 2000s, relaxing the rules against embryonic stem cell research trying to get funding for embryonic stem cell research. He basically said it may not help me, but it might help people in the future who have things like Parkinson's. 